1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul's letter, one of his letters, one of the two letters we have in Scripture, one of the at least three, maybe multiple uh, letters that he wrote to the church of Corinth, but we have two in Scripture. Church of Corinth, obviously, in Greece, and it was pretty much a perfect church. They were really good, never had any problems, so much so that he called them saints at the beginning of the letter. You guys remember that? And it was because they were so good, right? <laughs> Not because they were good, but because you are made righteous because of Christ, as were, were those at the corner. We talked in the last few weeks of the church was divided. Pride was at the root of the division, as pretty much it always is. And many of them thought that they were better than other Christians in the church, other people around, people in the community. They really thought that they were the real spiritual giants. They were, they were, would be what would be considered wise by the world standards. And so for them, they thought that that made, meant that they were super Christians as well. And the Apostle Paul tried to explain to them as gently as he could, it seems at times, um, that's not the case. That God's ways are the opposite of the world's ways, and to be great in the world's eyes would mean that you are not so great in God's eyes. Um, there is the comparisons throughout of the worldly wisdom and godly wisdom um, that we saw throughout. What are some other things that you guys remember in the first four chapters that we've covered in Corinthians? Pride was an issue. Pride was an issue. Pride was an issue with Satan. Pride was an issue throughout the Old Testament. Pride is an issue throughout the New Testament. Pride is an issue today. Always, right? What else? Thought the church should be further along. The church should be further along. They should be eating solid meat by now. And what does he have to give them? Yeah. Milk. You guys need milk. You should be further along than where you're at. He says. What was holding them back was, again, they were quenching the Spirit of God because of the pride and the division they had. So you're not going to keep growing. Your mind can't be renewed when you're being held back through these sins that are going on. What else? Puffed up, boasting. Yeah. Apparently there were the other apostles or these other people who were going through and they were trying to discredit Paul's ministry. And so in chapter 4, he talks more about um, his ministry among them and talks about his relationship with the church, and again, how they were kind of viewing themselves, and he um, goes through and talks about all the trials that he and the other apostles went through just um, for their sake, for the sake of the gospel. He even sent Timothy to them um, to remind them of his ways. We talked about if Timothy's going to go and actually show them Paul's ways, well then the assumption is that Paul and Timothy spent a ton of time together, and then that Timothy is going to live life on life with them so they can watch Paul, or they watch Timothy rather, and say, oh, that's how Paul would handle this situation. And so that means, that just implies right there that there's going to be a lot of time spent together. Not just, hey, I'm here on a Sunday morning for an hour and then we're apart the rest of the week. No, no, it's, it's gathering together, but it's also this life on life. And so he said, watch Timothy. He's my beloved child and faithful in the Lord. What else? Yes. The mysteries of the gospel, and we're to be good stewards of the mysteries of the gospel. And the Old Testament is really those mysteries there, and that's what they would have had at that time. And so the mysteries are getting known. And so Paul was a good steward, and, and Timothy was a good steward. And we're to be good stewards of the mysteries of the gospel, sharing the gospel, explaining the gospel. Why do we have hope in the gospel? It's part of what we're supposed to do. Good. What else? Anything? Mm -hmm. no, that. The, judge, the only perfect judge is God, and yeah. Paul could not judge even his own right. life right. Uh, perfectly or even... Right. Yeah. yeah. And that was a real good word for us because we're so often quick to judge people's motives. We're so often to say, well, I, I know what you were thinking, or I know what you were doing. He was doing this, or she was doing She was thinking this. He was thinking that. And what Paul ultimately says is, listen, you're going to stand before God one day. 
and he's the only one who knows everything, including our motives and what we've done. Paul says, I can't think of anything that I have, like that I've done wrong that I haven't repented of, but he goes, it really doesn't even matter what I think ultimately. It's it's God who's gonna that we're gonna stand before. And so that also leans into we want to make sure we're doing what we know is right in the eyes of God and not worry as much about it in the eyes of other people. And that gets into that language we talked about before of fearing man or loving man. Right? If, if I know, for example, that God God would have me drink this coffee because it's glorious and good, but I'm so worried about what you guys think, so I actually don't drink the coffee, then I'm more worried about what you guys think and what God would have me do. And that would be very man. I'll tell you a true story. This happened to me the other day. I, I, Proverbs talks about how the fear of man is a snake. Okay? So I was cruising by the, the post office. And I was going to, I pulled in and I got mail or whatever. And I walked out and there's somebody there, you just a random person, and I was kind of like, eh, had a quick conversation. I got in the car and left. Well, I had forgotten to drop off something else that I was there to do. Shoot. So I go back around, and then I saw the person still there. And so I kept driving by because I didn't want them to think that I was silly or dumb or something for coming back. And so then I'm just wasting time driving around the post office waiting for that person to leave. Have you ever done Am I the only one done this type of thing? Have you ever done anything? You'll get older, you'll get over that. Okay. <laughs> I don't have an excuse to walk up and say. driving around town all the time. <laughs> but it was so funny because I actually laughed at myself after I drove by. I was like, oh, wow, I literally just feared man to where now I'm trapped in the snare yeah. of not going to the post office freely when I could just do that and not worry about it. And instead, it's actually, you know, the Lord's teaching me through it, but it was actually something that I changed my day or something going on in my day because of what someone else might think. And what Paul was saying there is, don't do that. Worry about what God thinks. Be faithful there, and you know the rest will take care of itself. And so we want to be very careful not to judge others as well and their motives and things. That's for the Lord to take care of. We just need to focus on being faithful. Good. Anything else before we jump into chapter five? Verse twenty-two. The end of chapter 4, just for our context. Again, remember, this is a letter. So imagine we're the church at Corinth, and this letter has come to us, and I'm reading it out loud to you. He ended chapter 4 saying, um, But I will come to you soon. And we talk about this, if the Lord wills. We really need to become a people who really believe that everything about our lives is really ordained by God. And guess what? If God doesn't want you to go to Chiefland, and you're supposed to go to Chiefland that day, you're not going to Chiefland. <laughs> He will intervene in our lives. So he, he, it's wise for us to say, if the Lord wills. Then he says, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist of talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or the spirit of gentleness? And so that was the apostle saying, how would you like me to come and talk with you guys? And so ideally, we'd be reading this letter going, hey guys, Paul might come with a rod. <laughs> we better get squared away. And so that leads into the next chapter of something else that's going on with the church that he wants to talk about. Good evening. <laughs> All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Somebody start reading for us in verse 1. And it's a short chapter, only 13 verses, so I'm certain we'll get through the whole thing tonight together. So somebody go ahead and read for us probably the first uh, five verses. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as is present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Good. Next person pick up there, verse 6. <clears throat> Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Good. Next person. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual, sexually immoral people. Not at all mean the sexual immoral of this world. Or the cops, or the greedy and the swindlers, or idlers. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not as an not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idol, idolater, reveler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat such, not eat with such a one. For what I to do with judging outsiders. It is not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside and purge the evil person from among you. Whoa. <coughs> Whoa. <coughs> All right. <coughs> He's going to get specific now and address the situation. He starts off. And he's saying, it's reported among you, church, there is sexual immorality among you, and the kind that's not even tolerated by the pagans. What's he saying there? Super bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's stuff going on. It should be going on anyway. But now there's a kind among you that even, even the, the pagans, those who worship false gods, they're even like, oh my gosh. Okay? That's what he's saying. Now, what's the situation? A man has his father's wife. Now, why does it say it that way? Well, was the father's wife normally we would think would be the mother. But to state it that way would mean most likely the biological mother is not there, has passed away. And so this is like a stepmother type of thing. Okay? So somebody is being with the stepmom. Okay? So we know, of course, that, that would be there would be adultery involved there. That would be one realm of it. But now it's also within the family in a Father and a son saying that that's why he's saying no, like the, the, the pagans won't even do this, and you guys now here's what he says, verse 2. And how are they, and what's he say, how are they responding to it? Not just letting it happen, that's one thing, right? We're just gonna, hey, we'll do, well, yeah, we don't talk about that, you know, Fred and his stepmom, we just won't talk to him about that, right? It's not, it's not even that. They're arrogant about it. What does it look like today? Here's what it looks like today. It looks like stating we are so tolerant. We're so tolerant that this type of stuff, we're for that here. We come. Now, what we don't mean is we, we would say come to a worship service and hear the gospel preached. Everyone's invited. Come. They're just talking about being together in a part of the church being those who are followers of Christ, and this is what's happening. And instead of mourning this evil, this sin, they're celebrating it. They're going, this is great. We are the most tolerant church in town by far. This whole region, everyone knows that you can come to our church. What were you going to say, Peggy? No, no. Oh, okay. okay, that's the scene. They're woke. They, hey, the, per the church of Corinth was so woke. <laughs> Okay, that's really what the, the mindset would be here. That's, that's what's going on. And so they're saying, hey, this is this is great. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. You ought to be mourning. This is this is terrible. You shouldn't you shouldn't be excited about this. And then he says, let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now, many of you guys have heard me teach over and over again on the concept of church membership. This is one of the clear passages that shows us that there is such a thing. Okay? But remove from among you. Right? Right now, if we were to say, okay, 
Tom's done something. He needs to be removed from among us. There has to be an us for him to be removed from that. There's no us, then you can't be removed from anything, right? I told, and we said this before, our Church of Christ friends, praise God, they found their new preaching pastor. We're excited for them. And I said, why didn't I get to vote? They all vote. They, 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 I guess they took a vote of some sort. Is that what happened, Rachel? You took a vote and said if you wanted the guy, right? I didn't get to vote. How many of you guys got to vote other than Rachel? Did you guys get to vote, Church of Christ, that their new pastor? No? None of us got to vote. Why not? We're not a member. We can pray for them. We have no insight or input when it comes to what goes on at their church. We pray for them. We're part of the universal body of Christ. But they didn't ask our opinion. Now, I don't know how it went if they had people that were kind of there. I don't know if you have a formal list or not. Or it was like, hey, whoever's here this Sunday gets to vote. Or, you know how that works. I don't know for them. But that would be kind of rough too, right? If you were going to vote and like you just happened to miss that Sunday, and we're like, "Hey, we're going to a new preacher," and you're like, "Wait, a minute, I'm one of us. Why did I get to vote?" Oh, sorry, you weren't here, right? And, uh, we don't think that's what it is. It's probably not just who shows up that day, right? But you know your group, whether it's a formal list or not, it can be debated. But you know the group is. This is who we are. And if somebody just shows up, like, "Hey, I'd, I'd like to vote." <laughs> sorry, we don't know. You're not part of us. That's right. so. We see that here, and so he says, let the one who's done this be removed from one. <laughs> now, does this seem like this was a one-time event for the young man and his stepmother? One time event? Doesn't seem to be, right? It's going on? It's ongoing. It's ongoing, right. So this is repetitive. Okay, we don't get confused that one time you mess up. Ah, get him out! That's not what the text is saying, right? So he says, verse 3, For though I'm absent in body, I am present spirit. As, and as at present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who does such a thing. I don't know what that means. I, 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 really, I don't know exactly what that means in the sense of, other than the fact that we're tied together by the Holy Spirit, and so that Paul has some relationship with them, because he's an apostle, and he's saying that I'm not there physically, but connected to the Spirit of God because I'm, I have this relationship with you and this special authority because I'm the apostle who helped start this church and everything. He has some authority in that way. So he says, even though I'm not there, I'm one with you in spirit in that way. Okay? But it's definitely a little bit of a, you know, interesting verse. And he says, I've pronounced judgment on the one. Out. Every time we see that word judgment, how many of you start to get uncomfortable with the text? To be honest, yeah, it's like, ooh, that word. Rough. He says, I pronounce judgment on the one who did such a thing. And then he says this, look at this. When you are, ESV says, assembled. Assembled. Any other translations have something else? When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man, look at this, to Satan, for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. What is he talking about here? Well, this is when, um, so that he may be saved in the day of He's making clear to them this is sin, right? So he's making it clear, and then he's saying, when you're assembled together, now this is what this is this is the idea of what we would say are members meetings. You you could do this on a on a Sunday morning when the members are gathered, except you have other people there. That's not really something appropriate you want to handle at that time. So this is why it's when you're coming together as members, those of you who are assembled. You're to make this judgment call together. You need to make this call together. This is also why we would argue in our ecclesiology that the church is supposed to be involved in something like this. There would be other denominations that might say that it would just be the church leadership perhaps or even somebody outside of the church that would handle that. But the Apostle Paul, what we would understand here is saying when you're assembled together, then you do this thing. So if he's arguing when you're assembled together, that to us seems like that's a strong push for the congregation's involvement. Okay? 
It would be similar to mark this here and flip over real quick to Matthew 18 with me. Flip over to Matthew 18. You're familiar with this passage. Let me read it to you. Matthew 18, I'm beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Okay? One on one. You messed up, go to your brother. Okay? Or sister, this refers to. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, and that every charge may be established on the evidence of two or three witnesses. That's a principle from the Old Testament. Right? I came to you. This was a, something I saw. There was a sin there. I came to you. You didn't listen, so I'm going to bring somebody else. We're going to go and try to convince you together. Okay? Now, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let it be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Now, so what he's saying here is, take them, you know, you say, well, is this just the leaders of the church or is it the whole church? Well, I think, look, look, look pretty carefully what the text says. Take him to the church, and if he refuses to listen to them, well, that means the church would be speaking to him, right? I mean, so the idea is, if I'm begging Tom, 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 please don't do this, you know, whatever it is. Tom doesn't listen to me. So, so Tim and Daniel and I go together, and we talk to, to Tom, and Tom still doesn't listen. Then Tom gets with the whole church, and now you have Mary begging you, and Joni, and Miss Barbara, everyone begging you, please, please, please repent of this. The whole church. And if they still will say, I don't care what any of you say. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. That, that's the attitude here. It's not, you're right, I need to keep trying. If they're fighting, that's a different conversation. That's not what's going on here. This is, I don't care. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Okay, that's, that's the heart. That's the attitude of the person who has. And so then it's saying, if he refuses to listen to them, treat them as a Gentile and a tax collector. That's like, man, that's really tough on the IRS. <laughs> If you're in the IRS, you're not allowed to be a Christian. Is that what that means? <laughs> what about Gentile? How many of us are Gentiles in here? How many of you, yeah, all of us are so is it, treat them like us? No, what does that mean in the context? What's it mean? Outside of the church. Outside of the church. As a non-believer. Treat them as a non-believer. Why, Paul? Or Jesus here? Why do you treat them as a non-believer? Because they don't repent. But they don't understand. They don't understand. Not Right? They're not understanding. They're not repenting. And the Christian life is a life of repentance. It's not a life of perfection. It's a life of repentance. And so if they're going, I don't care, I don't want to change, and I'm not going to change, then Jesus says, then you have to treat them as a... As a. So that means you go back to evangelism mode. Okay? They're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not a Christian. So then you would, well, how would you handle anybody who's not a Christian? Well, you would, when you have opportunity, love on them and share the gospel with them and hope that they would believe. But it's really added a lot of confusion because they're saying that they're a Christian, but then they're, they're living this way. And so what Jesus said, continues to say, look, this is interesting. Truly I say to you, um, back in Matthew still, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Right? That just feels like that's coming. What is that? <laughs> Where's that coming from? What that's saying is that's the, that what's happening there in the church. They have what's known to be as the keys of the kingdom. What that means is that the church is how you're supposed to see. The church is how you see who's in the kingdom and who's not. Why? By this very thing. We affirm one another that we're Christians. How? Through baptism and then the ongoing participation in the Lord's Supper. That's how we're affirming you. Like, hey, take the Lord's Supper. Keep coming. Are you following Jesus? Keep taking the Lord's Supper. And we're affirming one another that we're following. That's what we're affirming here on earth is affirmed in heaven. And likewise, for those that would stop and say, no, I'm not going to repent of sin. I'm not going to be a part of the church anymore. Then the church would say, then you're not, you're not following Jesus. We can't affirm you any longer that you're a Christian. Because you're just doing this. And if you just do it without any conviction or any fight, then that, that's, you're not a Christian. We can't affirm you any longer. You may be in your heart. We can't see your heart. All we're saying is it just doesn't match up, and we can't affirm it any longer. And so what that would mean is then, what that's, if that ends up being true here, then that's true in heaven. And so the church is supposed to be very important in that sense. Christians are supposed to be tied to a local church. That's Your, your baptism gives you the entrance in, if you will, to the, the church. And then your ongoing participation in the Lord's Supper is the continuum. 
That's why then when there's church discipline scenarios, that's why part of the Lord's Supper being removed, that's part of the warning that we give, right? Hey, if you're if you're repentant, then make sure you do. But don't just stay unrepentant, repent and take the Lord's Supper. And then he says, Jesus continued to teach her, he says, um, again I say to you, so he's repeating himself for emphasis here, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Now believe me, this is not saying, context-wise, if two or three of us get together and ask for a Corvette, that the Lord's going to give that to us. That's not what that's saying. Some people pull that, that, that verse out, right? You can pull that verse out right there. Like Jesus says, Again, I say to you, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything, you want that Corvette, you will get the Corvette. As long as you give Pastor Billy one Corvette, you get two Corvettes. <laughs> you ask anything, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Wow, how many people have been hurt by that uh, misinterpretation of that verse, or misteaching of that verse? That's not the context of the verse, of the passage. And then this one also, as you know, is taken out of context all the time. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. How many times do we use that to say, hey, we're a church because there's two or three of us? That's not what it means. It means when you're walking through this and you actually have to use the keys to the kingdom and have somebody put outside the church, treating them like a tax collector, those that you've loved and you've walked with, Jesus says, I'm with you in a special way in that moment. I'm going to help you get through that. Okay? So Paul's grabbing what Jesus is saying back in our First Corinthians passage. So what they need to do then is you need to set him outside. So when you are assembled together at your members meeting or wherever it is, you get together and you need to set him apart. I'm with you, the Holy Spirit. We're united, Paul says. And by the power of the Lord Jesus, who promises that he's with you, and you have to do this really hard thing, you do it, and Jesus is with you. Set him outside. But here's the break. It's not to be mean. It's to hope to save them. That's the point. Set him outside, that they're that deliver this man to Satan, right? The church, if you will, the safety of the church. Set him outside so that Satan will have his way with the direction they're going with their choices anyway. Right? Let them go that way so that when they get out and it gets bad and they miss the fellowship and they miss, they go, ah, and they repent. Right? When you have a very, very close relationship with somebody and you have to draw the line and have a really hard moment with them. If they know you love them and care for them, they're going to be hurt, but eventually they should get to the fact that they know that you had their best interest in mind. Right? We because, of, hey, I love you. What's that? That's what we call the come to Jesus meeting. No, yeah, we're gonna, we need to have a come to Jesus meeting, right? I love you and I can tell you this, right? And sometimes they get upset and they leave for a while, but eventually, you know, usually time passes, whatever you were trying to tell them, it goes bad, they come back around and say, you're right. Some of you have this with your own kids. So you've had this with your grandkids. You've talked to them, you've warned them, they go off and hopefully eventually they come back around and say, ah, I wish I would have listened to you. Some of you did that with your parents and your parents, right? You go, oh, I wish I would have listened, right? It's kind of what's going on here. It's that same flavor. So the hope is, now here's it now, watch this. This is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. If you don't do it, then they stay doing what they're doing thinking that it's okay, and they never have that moment where they repent and come back. So actually, biblically, now this goes against everything that the world's going to say, even parts of like our own minds here, but this is the idea. If you don't do this, then you are helping usher them to hell. You are. If you don't say, we love you and we have to put you outside, then you're just affirming their behavior and they can end up in hell over that because they think they're fine. It's okay what they're doing. And it's not okay. They need to come back. They need to repent. And it's the removal from the church body as the means of grace that God uses to wake them up. And if you do not do that, man, we are hurting people because we're scared to do it. Because it's hard to do it. And we don't want to do it. And we love people. And we become okay with sin. We really have at least... Some sins. Right? There's those cultural sins, ones that we're more comfortable with. Just gluttony, we'll just make that one easy. We're a lot more comfortable with that one and allow that than we do other ones. Other ones we stand real firm on. And so we, we're really not loving the person at all. And that's what Paul's warning. He said, don't do that. Put them outside so that their, their body would be destroyed so that their soul might be saved. Okay? 
Your boasting, right? Now we get more into what they, the church of Corinth was doing wrong. Verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. First of all, I feel a little offended. He's calling me bread. Okay? I know. We thought, right? But what is going on here? He even then gives us one more detail. He says, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Are we talking about bread? We're not talking about bread, but how do we know where we should look in our Bibles when we're reading this passage to get what he's talking about? Passover. Good. He says Passover. Our mind should go Passover. I've heard that before. Exodus. So mark here. Let's flip back to Exodus for a moment. Our study Bibles are usually very helpful for this. Let's see. Exodus 12 sound good? You guys have another passage you want to go to? I'm thinking Exodus 12. Sound good? Jeff, Jeff, Jeff get a thumbs up. Good. Okay. But before we read Exodus 12 together, somebody needs to give us an update on what's happened in the first 11 chapters of Exodus. Last stuff with Pharaoh. Yeah. God delivers the Israelites through Moses. Right. Takes them out of Egypt. Good. He's taking them out of Egypt. They've been there now for a while. They're slaves, right? All through God providing for them through Joseph. They got down there. Things were good. Time passes, new pharaohs, things aren't so good, they're slaves. God's raising up Moses to deliver his people, right? Pharaoh's not cool with that, right? He's like, uh, I'm not so sure. No, no, no. So God's like, all right, I'll make sure that you're sure. I'm going to take them out anyway, and you're going to harden your heart, and I'm going to harden your heart, and it's going to be a bad scenario. So now, we have the Passover. The final plague is threatened. Somebody... Different who hasn't read yet. Read 12 verses, starting verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Okay, stop there real quick. This is going to be our new calendar. Our life is going to be built around this. This is kind of a big deal. You're going to have a lamb, and guess what? If you can't afford one, go to your neighbor. You guys are going to get together. Wow, this community mindset, right? Okay, continue, Mr. Carey. Verse 5. There you go. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Everybody's going to kill their lambs, and it needs to be one. Isn't this interesting? Without blemish, we know where the, our, our theological minds right now are already going. We're thinking, oh, the lamb, right? It takes away the sins of the world. So it's working in our brains, right? Good. Next person, pick up there. Verse 7. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. And not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. There's our phrase. This is the Lord's Passover. You're going to eat it this way. All these specifics. What was the note about the bread? What kind of bread? What does that mean? No yeast. No yeast. That was the language that Paul was using, right? Good. Continue, Tom. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you. 
when I strike the land of Egypt. Okay, this is how death passes over you: is the sacrifice of this lamb, the blood there, the spotless lamb. There's this meal. We're talking unleavened bread. Then it says in verse 14, this, shall, this day shall be a memorial day. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days. Watch this. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off of Israel. What does that sound like? You're cut off from the people of God if you eat any of this leavened bread. Get it out of your house even. Don't let it hang around the house. Because some of you, it's like peanut m ms If they're in the house, you're going to eat them. Get the, un- or get the leaven away from you. Because you're going to sin. Get it out. Right? That's what he's saying. And then for how many days? Isn't there something about that number seven? What does that seven usually mean in Scripture? Perfect. Perfect. The, the complete. The completeness of this unleavened. Okay, now, take all that, hold it there, put back the first Corinthians with me, now let's look what he says again. Your boasting's not good. Verse 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out, watch this, the old leaven... You may, have, you may be a new lump, right? Get it out of your house. That you may be a new lump. As, watch this, you really are unleavened. I get goosebumps. What does it mean that you're unleavened? You're righteous. Your sins are taken from you. You really are that way. What? Well, how does that work? Well, how did that happen? For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sent. That's why you're unleavened, because of Christ. Because He's that Passover, that that perfect, spotless Passover lamb. He's been sacrificed. Therefore, right? Let us therefore, because that's true, verse 8, let us therefore celebrate the festival. Not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil and sin, right? But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's what he's saying. You see how now the holiness and the pureness of this church is what he's talking about here. And so he said, guys, when I wrote to you the first, I wrote to you before, we call this first Corinthians, but this is actually not probably first Corinthians, but it is the one in scripture. We don't need the other one. But I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I was like, uh-oh. Well, what if I have a, a bad moment or a bad thought? Or what does he mean? And he goes. Not at all meaning the sexual moral of this world. I don't mean those who are non-Christians. And then, just in case you're like, well, that's okay, I'm pretty, I'm pretty holy sexually, so, you know, I don't know. so it doesn't bother me. I'm not immoral that way. He goes, well, let me just add a few more for you. <laughs> Greedy and swindlers and then he just says idolaters, which <laughs> if you really study that, it's just like we always are. It, you start. So it's, don't associate, right, with those who are defined by that. That's who they are. Not, again, I'm a follower of Christ and at times I still slip into those things. But I'm, no, no, I'm not a follower of Christ. I'm going to go be that thing. Okay, that's the difference of what he's saying there, right? I told you that before. I was a baseball player. Definitely not a baseball player anymore. We could go out and throw the ball around and hit a little bit even play a scrimmage game, I'm still not a baseball player as I once was. That's kind of the idea here. But he says, but I'm not telling you that you can't interact with those, those people in the world who are like that. Okay? Now why? Who are defined by that? Here's what he says. Since then, you would have need to go out of the world. If, if I'm telling you, you can never be around anybody who, who, who kind of says that this is who they are, then there's, you couldn't be around anybody. That wouldn't make any sense. I'm not telling you, in the world, the world's going to act that way. They don't have another identity. That is their identity. They don't have a new identity yet. Here's what he says. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. And your women are like, amen, that ain't me. No, brothers or sisters, right? If he is guilty of, now watch, 
Just in case you're getting worried you want to get all hung up on the section of morality, well, that's the, the topic of the letter, but that's not the, the principles further, right? Look what it says. Or greed, or as an idolater, or reviler, or drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. Wow. What's the difference between the two groups? This group over here, they have, this is just who their identity is. They're not following Jesus. And what's this group? The one that bears what? Christ's name. Christ's name. And they're saying that's their identity. Not that they do it some, but that's their identity. But yet they also say they're a Christian. Those two don't match up. Those two don't match up. So that's what he's saying here. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? I'm going to go around to the world and be like, get out of here. You can't do that. They don't know any. They're, they're lost. They don't know. Now, we share the gospel with them and explain that they're lost, but you don't judge in this way because they're lost. That's not what he's saying. No, no, no. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? This one goes in the face of a lot of, I mean, Christianity all the time. Always, don't you judge me. And a little bit ago, he was saying that only God judges us. So what is going on, Paul? You're confusing us here. Are we supposed to judge or not judge? What does he mean? Call sin, sin. Call sin, sin. Don't get into the motives. Earlier chapters, God, he will handle all that's going on there. Things that are clear, call sin, sin. Say, that's sin. We repent. You're not repenting. I'm not going to say what's really going on in your heart. We're just going to follow what God tells us to do. You could be saved for all we know. We're just saying we have to follow what he's telling us to do. And he says this. God judges those outside. He handles that. And then purge the evil person from among you. Get them out. It's not because the person sinned. That's not the point. It's that they're bearing the name brother and they're living that way and they're not willing to fight or even try. They're just like, I'm going to just do this. That's the difference. So when you do it, it's not to be mean to them. It's actually a means of grace to save them. Now, some of us have been in churches where they actually have done some form of church discipline and it was done very, very poorly. I'm going to give you an example of a church that is in Steen Hatchie, Florida where there was a pastor there who was doing church discipline, but he was not involving the congregation. He was just doing it himself. Now you have no witnesses of two or three or others, and it's just me against you saying, you need to get out of the church. The congregation didn't even know why it was happening. And then as it turned out, it really wasn't a clear case. It was something that needed a lot more wisdom. You want to know what it was? I'll tell you because you don't know the names of the people involved. And they're gone. Now. One of the members' wives came to church on Sunday and then went and sold goods to make money. Okay? The view of the pastor was you can't work or do anything on Sunday. That's the Sabbath. So if you do anything on Sunday, you're disobeying. She did that, you're out of the church. What's interesting is the document, the summary of their beliefs that they affirmed actually teaches that. So he wasn't inconsistent with their doctrinal beliefs. The problem was they didn't know what their doctrinal beliefs were. They were told this is what we believe. And there was no conversation, and it wasn't a repetitive thing either. It was just a confrontation, you're out. That's not appropriate. That would be going against Scripture, and it caused a lot of harm to the church. There's that extreme. Then there's the extreme of, you can be in our church and do whatever you want, and we won't say a word, we won't tell you. If you're living under unrepentant sin, none of our business. That's the other extreme. And biblically, is somewhere in between. And it takes a ton of wisdom to know how to walk that line when it comes. And that's really why you want to have a plurality of elders to help lead in that discussion with great amounts of wisdom. And the church has to be a praying church. And they need to be firm in the scriptures and understand why do we believe what we believe and understand these passages. Because it can be so damaging if done wrongly um, or not done at all. 
And Paul's writing to the church at Corinth saying, you guys aren't doing it at all. And you're really, really confusing those in the church because apparently you don't have to follow Christ. And you're confusing those outside the church. That's where the, the idea of, well, you're just a bunch of hypocrites anyway. Oh, I know Tom. I know Carrie. Yeah, he goes to church on Sunday, but you know what else he does? And nothing's ever said about it. Now, are they always right? No. But there's a reason that that kind of reputation exists. It's because we're not following what Scripture would say here. Thoughts? What was that? Wow. 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 Paul's good. We should listen to him. Yeah, go. And the thing it's damaging to the person that it's done to, but it's also damaging to the church. <coughs> when people ask, well, why don't you go to that church anymore? <coughs> yeah. Well, here's what happened to me. Right. And so it can be, can be a double not that <coughs> church, but other churches. Right. The body. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or it might be contagious and affect other people in the church. Well, that's part, part, apparently what he's saying is a little leaven. What's it going to do? It just, it just, it just grows, right? In your own life and in the church and in the body of Christ universal. And what do you see? We move a little. Sin gets its foot in the door. And then all of a sudden, we're really okay with a lot more. That's how it always works. We slide, 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 slide. Now, Peggy, what are you saying? Well, I was just thinking, um, we've been starting to look at James and Ooh. when it says to count it all joy... This is something to be joyful about in the end for that person who has been expelled. Yeah. If he finds his way back, yeah. that trial will have yeah. purpose in his life and for the church as well. Yeah. It, it, uh, it turns out to be for the good of everybody. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think these days it's harder for churches to do church discipline the right way because social media, you're going to get blasted. I've seen yeah. good churches do it the right way and get blasted because someone's heard or someone heard about it. It's like, why don't you go to that church? I was excommunicated, disfellowshipped, right. whatever. Right. Hearsay. And if you don't know, if you've never studied this, if you don't know how it's supposed to work, right. it looks very right. harsh or judgmental right. or, you know, right. hard. Right. So that's another, that's pride, that's fear of man. Right. That members kind of turn away from, well, let's not make a big yeah. deal out of it. Once you say you're not a member of us anymore, right. that's big. And remember, again, in our culture, you know, if you're not connected to the church here, yeah. you could find another one pretty easily. In this town, you could find another one. Like, really, if, if, if you know, some people just came over to the church Christ, you guys might be like, hey, we'll take people straight. We're excited, right? Or people come over here, we're like, sure. You know? And so some of it is you're just excited that other people are coming. But without persecution, much of it, um, without really, really needing one another to survive, the idea of can you imagine if you were in a country where you became a Christian, you lost your family because you became a Christian, then you started living this way, and now the church has put you outside? That's like your survival, perhaps, is now going. That's why I turn over to Satan, right? This idea sounds like death. Well, for some, it would actually could very possibly be. For us, it's not as challenging uh, in those ways physically, although relationally and spiritually it should be. Because if you're put outside the church, you're like, well, good, I don't like you guys anyway. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be, like, that would be a really sign of bad, you know, bad sign of unhealth there. Yeah. A lot of people think of it that way, though. Right. Because they can just right. go somewhere right. else. And that's really part of why when we have new members come in, that's why I'll call your former church. What if that's what you did? Right. Like, what if you were this guy who was kicked out and you just went, oh, well, I'm going to go I'm gonna go over to Philippi. You know, I don't care. I'll go slightly you know. over my wife. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> that's right. and they're not even going to know that, you know, what's going on. They're going to accept me just fine. Yeah. Now, that's where the body of Christ should be connected. And that's why I say, hey, what, what about this? Oh, no, no, no. No, not Joni. Don't let her in the church. <laughs> really? Why? What's going on there? That <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we try to do our due diligence and try to help other churches, and then they help us. Why? Well, because because honestly, you don't want that person to come in, and then they think they're okay. Because again, they're not being helped. They need that to see what's going on in the series. Now, I want to end on a really positive note. So, we'll, okay, just real quick. Second Corinthians chapter two. Sure. 
Listen to what he says. Second Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul writing the second letter, he says this. Um, For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. Uh-oh. So he's like, I'm not going to come and bring the rod again. Uh, For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one who I have pain? And I, and, and I wrote as I did. What, what is that? He wrote 1 Corinthians, right? As I did. So that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of, uh, of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of the heart, with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. I hate writing this. I have to tell you to do this with this guy. I didn't want to write that to you. I love you guys. Now, watch this. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you to know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven... What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for the sake of the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not the ignorant of his designs. It seems like he came back. And he's telling the church, it's a, let him back. He's, he's suffered enough. He's come back. It did what it was supposed to do. Don't be like, hey, we're going to have prayer time, everybody, but the guy who used to sleep with a stepmom. <laughs> Don't do that. Let him back in and just love on him. And hey, our sins are forgiven. And, and, and if God chooses not to remember them anymore, we do the same. And so that's the encouraging note. Look, why you see that it works right here and um, brings him back. In. Yeah. Okay. Any last things? It's good note to end on, right? All right, who's going to close this in prayer? Mr. Doug.